owls are um, birds of prey, also known as raptors. And that means that they are the top of the food chain for um, their particular niche. And with that, they kind of share that top billing with other raptors such as hawks. So owls would be the nocturnal version and hawks would be the diurnal or daylight version um, of the top of the food chain. Worldwide, we've got over 140 species of owls. And here in the United States, I believe, gosh, we probably have around 70. And in Pennsylvania, um, we have, no, I'm sorry, in North America, we have 19, that's all, just 19. And in Pennsylvania, we have seven that breed here and eight um, that we know of that are visiting. So we do have some owls that just come to visit and, and don't breed here. Owls vary tremendously in size. Um, the smallest owl is the elf owl, which is about as big as a Coke can. The largest would be the great eagle owl, which is a European owl. And I'm gonna show you on my tape measure how big that is. So you can imagine a bird with a hooked beak and talons that's this big um, flying at you. That would be something to see, I believe. So that's uh, the biggest owl. So owls have lots of different um, adaptations to help them fill in their niche. Um, but before we get to that, I almost forgot, I wanted to show you the relative sizes of our Pennsylvania owls. And I hope that you guys can all see this very well. So from smallest to largest, you can see there's quite a variation that we have. One of the things about owls is they really have quite a lot of um, plumage. They have their flat, their, their feathers are unique to their species. They're different than most other birds. And we'll talk about that in a second. But because they um, have so much plumage, they look to be bigger and heavier than they actually are. I'm gonna show you one of my favorites. Let's see if we can get Harry here in the picture. This is a great horned owl. Um, and he looks pretty big. Okay, so how much do you think that a great horned owl might weigh? You can put your comments in the chat. I wanna get a feel for what you guys think about how big this guy is. Aha, I see, I see a 10 pounder, anybody else? Three pounds, six pounds, 10 pounds? About three and a half pounds for a, for a bird of that size. So they have their feathers, as I said, are quite different than other birds. This particular feather that I have here, this is the wing feather from a wild turkey. And I'm gonna put it closer to the camera. So you can try, I'm trying to show you how smooth and tight it is along the top edge, okay? So I don't know if you can hear this, but it makes a lot of noise. When turkeys fly, their wing beats are very easy to hear. But on an owl, the feathers, get a good one. sorry about that. The feathers are kind of fringed. So they don't have that tight kind of interconnected weave, kind of the, where, the, where the individual pieces of the feather are Velcroed together. They're kind of fringed and fluffy. And what that does is that breaks up the air motion around their feathers when they beat them. So they don't have that loud flapping sound that you get with a regular bird. So that is what helps them with their night flight and being silent 
because since they are nocturnal, they need to be quiet and sneak up on their prey. So they also have very good eyesight. Now I know all you guys know that in order to see at night, you have to have really good eyesight. And owls have a feature that we don't have. They can't move their eyes. The muscles that, would, that we have to move our eyes back and forth and up and down, they have lost. They've given up the space that those muscles take to increase the size of their eyes so that then they can gather more light. So if I was an owl, you can see how big my eyes are in the, in the picture, my owls would be about that big. Okay, about as big as tennis balls. So to make up for the fact that they can't move their eyes, they're able to rotate their heads. Now, I know everybody has seen lots of pictures of, of owls rotating their heads. They cannot rotate their heads 360 degrees. They don't go all the way around, but they do go, in fact, three quarters of the way around. So that is a, a feature that they developed by adding additional vertebrae into their necks. We have seven vertebrae in our neck. They have 14. All right. What else other adaptations do they have? They have got excellent talons. Talons being the ends of their feet. And they've got quite sharp let me see if we can see this here. Quite sharp little claws almost on the ends of their feet. This is a talon um, from a saw wet owl. I don't know if you can see this really well. Normally I pass this around and you all get to feel how sharp it is. But they have very, very sharp talons for gripping their prey when they come down to it. So they, they can actually, they actually use their talons to, um, to subdue their prey. And, and kill it. So what are some other adaptations that, that they might have? Because they need to fly a lot, um, their wings are really quite long. They've got, I would say, wings, each wing is about as long as the bird is tall. So if we were to stand and put our arms out to our sides, our wingspan for both arms would be about the same as we are tall, okay? But for an owl, each wing is as wide as it is tall. So their effective wingspan is twice what ours would be, okay? So the other thing that they've got, which is different from ours, is um, the way their ears are arranged. Now I'm gonna show you another mount of an owl. Let's see, let's get this guy. This here is Barney, he's a barn owl. And I hope you can see that they've got a very distinct facial disc. So if I turn it a little bit, you can see that it's sort of concave around. So that actually acts very much like a satellite dish and it gathers sound um, by, the, by the arrangement of its feathers, it gathers sound and it directs it towards their ears. Now our ears, at least I think most of our ears, are on a level plane so that they're horizontally, they're the same across, but on an owl, they're offset. And I have another diagram of that. Hang on just a sec. So, can you guys see this all right? All right, so you can see that the openings, the ear openings are offset higher and lower. And that serves a very distinct purpose in triangulation of the sound. So because their ears are offset, they can get a good focus on where they hear their prey and they can kind of zoom in on where their prey is and then go and get it. All right. Um, we talked about their eyes a little bit. 
One of the ways I like to describe their ability to capture light with their eyes is if you were in an arena, a big arena, like the Houston Astrodome or one like that, and there was only one little tea light candle lit, um, that would be enough for an owl to find a mouse. All right. Now when owls eat, they don't have teeth, right? Most birds don't have teeth. So they have to gulp their prey. And so they gulp their prey, or they, they can, you know, if it's a big one, they'll, they'll rip pieces off, but they basically just gulp it down. And so because of that, there's a lot of parts of their meal that they can't digest. So what do they do with all those parts? There's fur, there's bones, there's lots of different things that they can't digest. And what happens with that is that they gather it in a spot in their neck and it gets balled up and it forms what we call an owl pellet. And in my slideshow later, I have a picture of one. But what I have here is some dissected owl pellets. And so in here we've got, let's see if you guys can see this. There's a skull, okay, of a small rodent. There's some leg bones. Let's see, good look at that. There's some leg bones, again, of a small rodent. And because of this, because of the way they um, regurgitate this undigested material, you can tell what an owl's been eating. So a fun thing to do is to get an owl pellet and dissect it. And then we've got graphs, graphics of the different shapes of the skulls, the shoulder blades and the leg bones. And by comparing what you find in your owl pellet, you can tell what your particular owl has been eating. So you can see we've got different skull shapes for moles and rats, mice. And usually when you get these from a supply house, they come sterilized, so you don't have to worry about them. But one of the ways that you can track down where an owl might be is to look for at the base of a tree um, some of these owl pellets. And then, you know, if you if you want to, using gloves, you could dissect it yourself and find out what the owl that was in that tree has been eating. All right. Any questions about any of this? I was a little distracted, Diane. I'm not sure. There was a question in the chat about um, great horned owls being territorial. Did you cover that one? I did not. Yes. All right. They're asking about it, if they return to their nest each year, or if the and or if the offspring offspring stay in the breeding area for next season. Okay. Owls are territorial, and if a mated pair has had good breeding success, they will return to that nest. Um, interestingly, a lot of times, great horned owls and red-tailed hawks will share a nest. The breeding season for great horned owls is now. Okay, right now owls are um, mating, they're laying their eggs, um, they've, they've found their nesting place. If they've been successful, they'll come back to the same place, spruce up the nest, have their babies. And by the time their babies are gone and fledged, it's time for red-tailed hawks to come and do their, their, their mating behavior and their nesting and they will, they will spruce up that same nest. So these nests tend to get bigger and bigger and bigger over time. They do make um, stick nests. So the young will um, not stay in the same territory because there's only room for a certain pair in a certain amount of space. So they will have to go fly elsewhere and um, discover their own territory and their own uh, mates. So they do not stay um, in the same area as their parents. Oh, I see, a, I see a question just came up. Can owls ever be pets? I would say no, um, as opposed to Harry Potter and Hedwig. Um, owls do not, um, do not make good pets. They, they're quite wild. They don't take very well to being caged. Um, it's not like a, a parakeet um, or a small bird like that. So they, they, need, to, they need to fly free. 
Any other questions? Owls are not aggressive to humans um, unless you are bothering their nest. Um, if you go um, on YouTube or on Google and look for videos of scientists that are climbing up into nests to ban the owls, the, uh, the birds will go after um, the scientist who is trying to take hold of their, their babies and weigh them and put a band on them. Um, so, you know, they do, they do wear helmets and gloves and lots of protective equipment because the owls will swoop at them and try and protect their young that way. Can I re-review the owl species? Yes, I will do go through the owl species in Pennsylvania. So, let me get my poster up again. Somebody also asked the, oh, sorry. I'll be going through these in the slideshow, but we've got the saw wet owl, which is a winter visitor, screech owls, which are here year round, and they come in two colors. Hang on, I'll show you, show you my two, my two screech owls. This one, okay, is a red faced screech owl. And this one is a gray faced screech owl. These guys are cavity nesters and they generally tend to find a tree that's basically the same color as they are. So a red faced screech owl would be at a pine tree, which tends to be a little bit red. And a gray faced screech owl would be in a cavity in a tree with gray bark, like an oak or a beech or something like that. Well, the questions are okay. coming in quickly now. Continuing. Oh, sorry. Going up, up in 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 size. <laughs> so we had the sawwet as the tiny one, the screech owl, then the short-eared owl. Um, I understand, although I haven't been able to see any myself, that over in New Jersey at Mercer Meadows, they do have a number of short-eared owls that nest there. Then the long-eared owls, the barn owl. The barred owl, the snowy owl, which is a winter visitor, and the great horned owl. Okay, I'm sorry, Stacy, you were asking a question. Yes, sorry, um, the questions are coming in um, pretty quickly now, so um, I want to <laughs> make sure that I'm just want to make sure that we're keeping moving. Um, somebody asked about um, if the great horned owl is is hooting for sort of hours on end. Does that mean that they're looking for a mate? It can be one of two, two reasons, uh, depending on if you hear one or two. So a great horned owl male will hoot um, in, in, a, in a pair with its mate and they'll call back and forth. And another reason that a great horned owl will hoot is to announce its territory. Basically it's hooting to all the other male owls that this is my place, go away. Um, so they, they, they will hoot to just kind of announce their presence and say, you know, you got to go find someplace else to be because it's not, here is not available. All right, a couple more. Um, can an owl scoop up a small dog like a hawk can? Yes. Yes, it can. Mm -hmm. Yes. The, Especially the, the, like the big great horned owls. Yes. Not the really small but, saw, so, no, you know. No, 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 a saw wet owl or a screech owl could not, but a great horned owl can certainly take a small dog or a cat. Uh, and somebody asked. Um, I think they were um, confused by the um, by the taxidermy owls that you were that you were showing, and they asked if they were pets. No, those are taxidermy. Um, owls are protected, but they do die. Um, and so people, when they when they find them, if they're in good enough condition, we can take them to a taxidermist and get them stuffed, and then use them for teaching. Because you would not you know, get close to a, an owl um, otherwise. Now, t a lot of time, a lot of a lot of years past, we've been able to get um, Mercer County Wildlife um, to come here with their teaching owls. They do a lot of rehabilitation of all kinds of creatures, birds, deer, raccoons, possums. And if a bird cannot be released into the wild for one reason or another, they try to um, get it acclimated enough to people that they can bring it and use it for teaching. Um, 
which is always quite a uh, quite an experience to get up that close to to a live owl. They um, because of the pandemic, they were not able to come tonight with their live owls, and it's been uh, it's been difficult for them to keep up with the training as well. So it's going to be a while before they're ready to come back out with their with their live animals and and visit with us again. But it's uh, it's quite an experience to get up close and personal with with an owl. So no, not pets. In fact, um, you know, I kind of goofed around a little bit and, and named my taxidermy, you know, Barney and Harry and whatnot. But um, they're quite serious about keeping their animals as wild as possible, so they don't name their they don't name their birds because it's a it's a wild animal. Okay, anything else? Before we and get there are to the slideshow, other quick questions. Um, somebody asked about the size and color of owl eggs. Owl eggs are basically white and speckled. Um, and of course, the size varies with the species. You know, solid owls will have small eggs, probably uh, about the size of a robin egg. And a great horned owl egg will be just a little bit smaller than a chicken egg. Excellent. And then one final one. Um, would you say the PA has all kinds of owls? Well, we've got the eight different species. So not as many as there are, you know, in the United States, not as many as there are in the world, but a nice variety of, of species. All righty. That takes care of all the questions in the chat for right now. Okay, thank you all. So, thank you very much. Good questions. All right. I'm going to get myself organized here to share my screen and go with the slideshow. Okay. And come on. Pay attention. Come on. There we go. All right. So we're going to go through our various species of owls. We're going to talk about um, their characteristics, their habitat, what they eat, um, what their young are like, and so forth. So We've got our seven breeding species of owls and our, our eighth visitor, um, which is the, uh, the snowy owl. So this one, this here, owl with the sparkling eyes is the, a close-up picture of a great horned. Here's our great horned and our barn owl having dinner. This one is the barred owl, B-A-R-R-E-D, screech owl. Long-eared owl, kind of wide-eyed, funny-looking little owl. The saw-wet owl. The short-eared owl. And the snowy owl. All right, so let's take these guys one at a time. All right, this is a great horned owl in attack mode. This guy is swooping down on his prey. I'm going to play the call for you, this, the sound of a great horned owl is what people generally consider um, the sound they think of when they think of an owl. It's a hoot. Um, let's see if it'll play for you. Let's play that again. Okay, so that's a pair hooting back and forth. It is um, the heaviest and the most powerful owl that we have here in North America. It's not as big as the, uh, the great gray owl that's in Europe, um, or the great eagle owl that's, sorry, that's in Europe, but it is a, a, good, a good sized owl, as you saw from it. Okay, they have very, very strong talons, strong enough that they can snap the neck of their favorite prey, which is a groundhog. It's a fairly bulky bird, and it has those feather tufts, um, which is where it gets its name of the great horned owl. Those are obviously not horns, they are feathers. Um, they're not ears. They're strictly used for camouflage. When a bird is in a tree, um, it's useful to break up the silhouette, and that's what those ear tufts are for. All right, this is where they like to live. Um, good sized woods, 
with big trees, strong, big enough to hold their, their large nests. Um, so they like old hawk nests, old crow's nests, uh, mature woods. Here is um, a fledgling. They're fluffy, kind of funny looking. Um, they generally have possibly three, two or three fledglings in a nest at a time. When they are five to six weeks, um, they become better feathered and they will be able to fly at around 10 weeks. So they hunt woodland edges, they like open fields, they will try and get squirrels, um, groundhogs, rats, crows, other small owls, your neighborhood cat, if your cat is out at night. Um, and one of its favorite prey animals is a skunk. You wouldn't necessarily think of a skunk as an excellent prey animal given the defenses that they have of their stinky spray, but owls, like most birds, do not have a very good sense of smell. They don't really care much about the spray from a skunk because they can't really smell it. So that's another favorite prey of a great horned owl. All right, the next owl we'll talk about is a screech owl. So here's a gray phase screech owl in a cavity in a tree with um, gray bark. I'm gonna play the sound here for this one. This is a, a very much of a different sound from the great horned owl, it's not a hoot at all. Um, the first time I ever heard one, I didn't know what it was. I thought um, there was an animal in great distress. So let's see if you guys can hear this one all right. So the first time I heard that at night, uh, I didn't know what it was. I thought some, it was a, a horse that, that was in, in distress, because to me, that sounds like a, a whittying horse. So that is the sound of a screech owl. And that, that will be one of the owls that we try and call into us um, Saturday night. So there's a gray, and here's a red, a red-faced screech owl. And they are very much accustomed to living near people. They like edges. Um, deciduous forests, um, suburban edges, orchards, um, open woodlands, and even um, you know your, your neighborhood park. So they are cavity dwellers. So anytime that there's a tree um, that has had a woodpecker in it, um, they'll happily take over that, um, that cavity from the woodpecker when the woodpecker is done with it. Um, they also are quite happy to use nest boxes. So this pileated woodpecker is excavating its nest, and when it's done, um, a screech owl may very well decide to take that over. So here is some baby screech owls. This is a typical sized um, brood of screech owls. Four, three or four is typical for them. Um, and they uh, have what, done what we call branching out. When the birds get too big to all of, for all of them to be in the nest at once, they go walking out onto the edge of their um, the, one of the branches where their nest has been, um, has been made. And at this point, they really can't fly. So they have to kind of stick um, to the branches and you know, go back and forth from the cavity to the branches. Um, the parents will keep feeding them for quite a number of weeks. Um, and they, uh, they like to eat flying squirrels. Um, they eat frogs. They'll get mice, rats, small rabbits. Um, and that's, you know, that's not atypical as well as other birds. If they can find another bird, uh, most birds are not nocturnal. So um, if they can find a bird at night, they will quite happily take that as well. All right, here in, um, here in Bucks County, um, the barn owl is a particular owl of concern. With the uh, suburbanization of the county and the conversion of farms um, into other types of development, they're losing some of their habitat. Uh, so um, trying to, uh, to maintain the ability um, to keep our barn owls, they're very important to, um, to agriculture because they are really excellent at taking vermin from farms so that uh, farmers will use just for their crop. These birds also do not have a hoot. I know most people think of owls as hooting, 
Um, they have more of a, a kind of a screech or a scream. So maybe a hissing sound. So their preferred hunting grounds, oh, there's a good picture of its face. So again, you can see the facial disc where it gathers the sound for its, for its ears. All right. So they like to hunt over open fields, meadows, farmlands. They fly low to the ground in search of meadow voles, mice, shrews. There's a good picture of one in flight. Um, I had one fly over my car um, once at night. It was quite startling because the underside of their wings are very bright white, especially in car headlights. Um, so they're quite, uh, quite remarkable to see. That doesn't happen very often, um, but it's remarkable when it does. So here's one of their favorite prey is the little metal vole. And they, where they nest, they'd like to nest in silos and in old barns. Um, they use a flat surface to make their nests and they raise anywhere from two to 11 young. So you can see that they are on a flat surface. They make sort of a pile of gravel and sand and other materials with a depression in the middle of it. Um, and that's the, where they, they lay their eggs. So they need a flat surface um, and they can use something that we can add to the side of a barn or the inside of a silo. Um, and we've been trying, I know the DCNR and the game commission have been trying to recruit farmers to allow some nesting places in their barns um, so that we can try and maintain the, the habitat and the, the number of owls that barn owls that we have in the county. All right, our next owl is the barred owl, B-A-R-R-E-D. Um, the name comes from the streaking on its chest and they are, I would say uncommon, but not rare. So they like um, deep woods, and they have a very puffy dome-shaped head. And one thing I'll point out here is some of the owls that we've been looking at have different colored eyes. The uh, great horned owl's eyes were, were yellow and this owl's eyes are, are quite dark. All right. Did I miss the sound on that one? No, not yet, okay. So here's a picture of one showing the extent to which an owl can turn its head. So we're looking at the front of the owl's chest and the back of its head. So I don't recommend you try this at home because we can only turn our heads about 90 degrees each way from center as opposed to what this owl can do. Here's where they like to live. They like swamps and other damp areas. Um, let me see if we can... There's the baby. I'm looking for the slide with my sound. The sound, there, there it is. There it is. My, pick, my, my face was in the way. All right. So this is an interesting one um, because a lot of people think that this owl is saying, who cooks, who cooks, who cooks for you all? So let's see if you guys can hear that and agree with that. So you can decide for yourself if that is who cooks for you. All right. Okay, so this is a baby, um, what we would call a fledgling. He's uh, not quite ready for his flight feathers, but his down is starting to, to go away. Um, and like I said, they prefer to live where there's a lot of water. Um, they will catch frogs as well as um, other rodents like most owls. They like these guys, which I'm very sorry about. When Stacy was going through our our uh, upcoming program, she did not mention our, the frog walk, which will be probably late March. Um, so I'm, I, I really like frogs as well as owls. So I'm not really happy that they're to prey for these owls, but hey, everybody's got to eat. All right. So they're also cavity dwellers. 
um, and they would do that particularly in old growth forests. All right, our next little owl is this guy. This is the saw wet owl and they are primarily from the north, but they do come down here in the winter. Um, this is the owl that was stuck in the tree that went to Rockefeller Center in New York. Um, took, a, took a ride down from upstate New York into Manhattan and then took another ride back home. <laughs> he was okay. Um, I, it, was a, it was a good story for the Christmas time. So they have a very um, distinct sound. I'll let you hear it. Northern Sowet Owl. And they, they, do, they do that tooting over and over and over. And that other little sound, <laughs> that other sound is the young begging um, for food. So between the tooting of a backup truck and a little screaming baby, that's what so what owls sound like. Okay. Here are the young. Um, and you'll notice the markings on their face are quite distinct. And there's a reason for that. Um, since they are cavity nesters, um, when they're in a dark cavity and mom is coming back with the food, that distinctive marking on their face is kind of like an arrow pointing to where their mouth is. So when they open their mouth and say, feed me that bright white marking is kind of like an arrow for mom to be able to see where to deposit the food. This is their preferred territory. Um, they uh, don't need as much old growth forest as some of the larger owls do, but because they are cavity nesters, they do need a certain, a tree of a certain amount of size. All right. Now these owls, if there was gonna be an owl that you were gonna try and tame, it would probably be this one. Um, they are small um, and relatively ac accepting of humans. Um, but you need a good supply of mice to, uh, to keep a, a saw wet happy. There's one swallowing it whole. All right. So there, uh, I just put this picture in cause I like it. I just think it's adorable. Um, having it look out of the cavity like that. All right. Our next owl is a long-eared owl. So again, those things on top of its head are not ears. Those are feather tufts and they're used for camouflage. And if you look at this pine tree that it's roosting in, you can see there's a lot of broken branches that look somewhat similar to the tufts of feathers on its head. So the idea is to break up its silhouette and to make it blend into the, the broken branches of the, uh, the, the evergreen tree that it's roosting in. They are um, quite secretive. We don't know that much about their behavior in Pennsylvania um, and the breeding status here in Pennsylvania is also a little bit uncertain, but it's believed that they do breed here. So they can, they can compress their feathers into a narrow shape like this particular owl. However, when they are um, concerned or distressed, they can puff themselves up to look completely differently. Um, trying to make itself look bigger. That's a pretty typical defensive behavior. You make yourself look bigger and scarier to whatever you think is coming after you. All right, let's play the sound of this one. So they typically have that single hoot. Um, this is one of the owls that does in fact make a hooting sound, um, but where the, this is a single hoot, the great horned owl has a four or five note hoot call. So they are primarily coniferous forest dwellers. They like evergreens. Um, they prefer that or that's, that helps with their, with their camouflage ability. And they also will nest in an abandoned crow or hawk nest. So they are not cavity dwellers. They do have a stick nest 
Um, and again, they tend to take over a nest from a, a previous occupant, um, spruce it up a little bit and have their young there. So this actually is a young one. No, this is not, that's okay. So this is actually a young one. This bird is about three weeks old and they can fly when they're about six weeks old. And they are primarily um, rodent eaters as well with mice and voles. However, they also will eat frogs and even large insects such as this leopard moth. They also will, pr will predate screech owls and saw wet owls because they're quite a bit bigger than they are and they will take them as well. All right. So our most uncommon or rarest breeding owl in Pennsylvania is the short-eared owl. They are ground nesters, which is quite unusual for, for an owl. The, here's a, one on its nest. It's quite well camouflaged in the, in the grasses where it, where it nests. Um, the female incubates them solely, although the nest can be made by both the male and the female together. So here, somebody asked a question before about eggs. Here's a, here's a typical nest of a short-eared owl. Um, they have quite a large brood, so a couple of these guys have hatched already. And so you can see these are about, maybe a little bit smaller than a, than a chicken egg, and um, white with some speckles. These guys are about hmm, three days old only and they can um, support themselves and beg for food when they are just that, that young. It's important since they're ground nesters that they mature quickly because being ground nesters, they're subject to predation a lot more readily than birds that are in cavities or up high in trees. So they have to develop a little bit quicker um, so they can get out of the way of trouble a little bit sooner than their other um, cousins. So here's a guy in his defensive posture. He's a young one. Um, he's only about three weeks old. So he's probably moved some distance away from, from home at this point. This is um, one of the predators that will take um, a short-eared owl. So, you know, foxes are, have good noses and good ears and they can find their prey very, very readily. They can be diurnal, um, or crepuscular or nocturnal. So foxes are active all times of the day. And uh, they, so the owls really need to be on the lookout for these guys. All right. So here's a snowy owl. These are one of the few owls that are diurnal. You'll see a snowy owl in the daytime. Um, they are infrequent visitors from up north. Although I guess it was back in 2014, we had quite an eruption of snowy owls. Um, there were quite a few owls along the Jersey shore. There was one at the Philadelphia airport. There was another one at Boston airport um, because that's the kind of environment that they like. They prefer to be in wide open spaces like the Arctic tundra that they come from. So spaces like this, um, will be some of their preferred habitat. So this is a male snowy, mostly white. Oops, why did you do that? Go back. We're gonna play the call of this one. So it sounds like a bark. So that's the, uh, that's the male and that's the female. And again, she has got those markings for camouflage. So you can see owls can open their mouths quite wide in order to be able to gulp their prey. Here's a picture of one in flight. They fly relatively low looking for their prey, which again can be small rodents, um, other small birds, but primarily rodents. A lot of times the, um, the eruption from the north will, will happen because there's a scarcity of food 
However, the uh, eruption of 2014 uh, was determined that it was not because the owls were, were hungry. The animals that were caught and tagged were in quite good shape. They were very healthy, very well fed, very well hydrated. And it was determined by the scientists that were doing the work that the reason that we had so many owls coming to visit from up north was that there had been a particularly good breeding season and the owls had to disperse farther than typical to find places to spend the winter because there were so many of them. So it, they can have an eruption because of poor food conditions up north or because they have been so successful that they need to spread out more. So um, if anybody is particularly interested in, in snowy owls, I recommend that you um, look into Project Snowstorm, which is a, uh, a, a, a science project that's been ongoing where they put um, transceivers on the owls and track their movements. It's, it's quite fascinating how far they can go. So um, that's one place you can look for more information on snowy owls. So here is a picture of the nest. They also nest on the ground. Um, it takes about three weeks for them to be able to leave the nest. Here's a fledgling. You can see the coloration again, camouflaged. Um, and then they can go to the dunes and be hunting for rabbits, squirrels, um, other sorts of um, typical small mammals and rodents. All right. So from there, um, I could talk about a little bit about the dangers of owls. I, I'm going to stop sharing my screen because I want to um, just talk a little bit about some of the some of the issues that we have for owls. So um, we are fairly fortunate here that we've got a good population of screech owls and great horned owls, um, and again some barred owls in the area. But one of, the, one of the problems that owls will run into since they are at the top of the food chain is that any contaminants or pesticides that um, are ingested by their prey will concentrate into their bodies as they eat their prey. So um, if you're having a mouse problem or something like that, we recommend that you find a method other than poison for um, controlling your rodent problem because as if the owls will eat um, the carcass of a mouse that's been poisoned, then it poisons the owl. And that is um, certainly not gonna be at least a bit beneficial to, to us or them. So that's one issue that, that owls have. Another issue that owls have is um, a lot of times folks will do something like be having an apple in their car and they'll say, oh, well, you know, my apple core, that's, um, that's biodegradable. It's food for somebody. I'll just toss it out the window. Well, if you toss your apple out the window and then a mouse decides to go eat it and then an owl sees the mouse and goes to get the mouse. Meanwhile, there's a car coming down the road. Um, so if you have a mouse on the edge of the road and an owl going across the road to get the mouse and the car coming, you can see that that can be a, a difficult situation and the owl is not gonna win. Um, so again, things like that are not something that we think about all that often, um, but it can be certainly detrimental to, um, to the owl population because they're going to go after the mouse who's going after your apple core and can't help with car. Okay. So I see a question about a poison rodent uh, disposed of in the woods for an owl to find. What happens to a lot of times with the, with the rodenticides that are used is that the mouse will ingest the rodenticide and then you know, leave usually to go look for water because a lot of those rodenticides um, cause them to get very thirsty. So they'll leave your house and go looking for water and then die. And then you know, a, a hawk or an owl can then pick up the carcass and, and eat it because they, they will scavenge as well. And that takes care of that. All right, so um, a lot of my other slides were um, concerned with, you know, threats to owls and it, I don't really want to leave you guys on a depressing note. So <laughs> I'm going to skip over those other slides. Um, so are there any other questions? There are a bunch it. of questions. <laughs> All right, let me get back to where, where, where the other questions started. Um, all righty. 
We always have to have one of these. So do you think it would be fatal if you got into a fight with an owl? Mm, to who? <laughs> the owl or you? <laughs> Um, I, don't I, don't, I don't think an owl can kill a person. Um, I think even the great eagle owl, which is, you know, nearly three feet in height, would have a tough time subduing a human, but they could do a lot of damage. Those talons are very, very strong. They can exert like 250 pounds per square inch of pressure. So if a, if a great eagle owl got its talons around your throat, yeah, maybe, but... <laughs> Are you going to really let an owl get near your throat? That's, you know, that's probably not going to happen. So I would say, you know, it would hurt a lot to get in a fight with an owl, but I don't think you'd die. Excellent. All righty. Um, and we have someone who is hearing something in the morning around 530. Um, and it sounds like an owl, but she's not sure if it's an owl or if it's a dove. Ah, okay. Well... What you could do is, you know, record the sound on your smartphone and send it to me and I'll figure it out for you. Um, doves do make a sort of cooing sound, but at five o'clock in the morning, it's still dark and doves are not usually up before the sun. So, you know, it can go, it could go either way. Alrighty. Um, somebody actually had a question about a crow, about crows. Um, what is the behavior of crows all about that take a position near the nest, flying around and squawking? Their, their own nest? It's unclear to me, but I'm guessing their own nest, yes. Okay, because I mean, crows will predate other nests. So a, a crow will go after another bird's nest, either for the young or for the eggs. So um, so it could be doing that, trying to scare the parents away so it could get into the, another bird's nest. Um, but if it's their own nest, there's the possibility that there is a different sort of predator in their nest and they're trying to chase it away. Animals like snakes, raccoons, um, other sorts of creatures that can climb do make a habit of climbing into bird's nests for eggs and young. Um, if you watch any of the eagle cams that are, that are all over the net, um, occasionally you'll see a fight between, you know, a, an eagle and a raccoon who's trying to get into the nest to, uh, to take the eggs or the young. So it could be that, you know, the, the crow was trying to chase away a predator, or again, it was trying to chase away the adult of a different species of bird so it could get into their nest and take their eggs and young. Kind of hard to tell without knowing whose nest it was. All righty. Um, next question. Um, this person um, walks a great deal in, in Peace Valley, Naka Mixon, and has, it sounds like, has been very unsuccessful in ever seeing any owls. Um, are there times of day where you might see them? I'm assuming, you know, she doesn't want to go out walking at night. Um, are there, are there any ways of possibly being more likely to see them during the daytime? Okay, well, yeah, you can't you can't walk at Knox and Mixon or Peace Valley at night. It's not allowed. So they're they're like us, they open dawn to dusk. So what you need to look for um, is a stand of, I would say probably look for a stand of very old trees. And then what is the best way to look for a roosting tree is to look for what we call whitewash coming down the trunk. So that is a bird that's been sitting in its roost and going to the bathroom and it drips down the trunk of the tree. So you'll see what looks like um, drippy white paint um, and that would be a good roosting tree. And then because they are so well camouflaged by um, the tufts on their feathers, you're gonna need to look for a particular sort of shape. So you wanna look for you know, a particularly wide spot where you wouldn't expect to see one. They do tend to roost close to the trunks of trees. So look for a, an odd shaped bump coming out of the trunk of a tree. Um, but, you know, primarily looking for, looking for the whitewash is a good way to determine which trees are being favored for daytime roosting. And that's, um, that's one way you can see them. Excellent. Alrighty, um, this next question is about um, the sounds that they make. Um, when they're vocal are they using like a vocal cords like like we have or are they using something else to, to, to create the sounds? 
Um, the, all birds do not have vocal cords like us. They have a different construct in their throats that allows them to sing or make those calls. And it's got a strange Latin name that I that escapes me at the moment, but they don't have a voice box like we do. They have a different structure to make their sounds with. All righty. Um, and then there are a couple of people who are curious about um, how much do they eat? Um, so if they were eating mice, how many might they eat in a day or, or something like that? Oh, well, um, generally speaking, <laughs> as many as they can catch, um, I would say a typical, well, a saw-wet owl might eat a mouse or two, um, and a great horned owl, probably, you know, depending on if it caught something big, um, you know, if it was catching mice, it would need a dozen, uh, it's a big bird, but if they're, if it's catching a rabbit or a squirrel or something like that, probably one would do. Absolutely. Um, and they might even go some days without eating if they're oh, yeah. they successful they're not always, in catching things. Right. They're not always successful hunting, you know. Yeah. That's, uh, that's one of the consequences of being at the top of the food chain. You hunt a lot and you don't always win. Exactly. Um, someone was asking about um, owl sanctuaries and somebody else recommended the, the Raptor Trust in New Jersey. Are there any other um, like places where you could go and, and visit where you would be more likely to see owls? Well, Mercer, um, Mercer does have um, flight space. Um, they have, they've, they've done a, a several um, outdoor aviaries. So you might check, check Mercer, that's just south of Lambertville on 29. Um, I'm not sure about ARC. ARC is up in, I guess it's up in Chalfont now. Um, but the Raptor Trust is probably one of the best places. They have an amazing collection of birds that cannot be released. Um, it's, I would say it's probably about, it's only 40 minutes away, maybe 45. Um, and it's well worth the visit. They have a, an amazing assortment of, of birds of prey that they have um, rescued and taken care of that can't be released. I'm a supporter of theirs. They, they do good work. Excellent. Um, I think this question was asked before you started talking about it. Um, I know you mentioned um, foxes preying on a lot of, especially the small owls in the, in the ground nest. Are there other things that prey upon owls? Well, we, you know, we did talk about, you know, other creatures getting into the nests. But once an owl makes it past the fledgling stage and is flying around, there's not much that's going to catch it. So, I mean, you may, you may end up with owls, you know, battling each other over territory or maybe a, a hawk and an owl getting into it. Um, I, know, I know crows particularly like to mob owls, but that is not to predate them, it's to chase them away from where they don't want owls near their nests. So um, that again is a consequence of being at the top of the food chain. There isn't much that can come after you. There we go. Um, someone else had a question, um, again, going back to great horned owls. Um, and we, you talked about the fact that they'll come back to the same area sort of year after year. Um, do you have any ideas, is this, will they do it for like, you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years, you know? Is, is there like an average of how long or do they spend their whole life in one area? I honestly don't know the answer to that question, but I think they would probably have good um, site fidelity as long as they were successful. Um, if, the, if the nest was successful and they, they raised young um, successfully, they would most likely come back as long as they continue to be successful. So trying to remember how long they live in the wild, um, I would think 10 years would be a lot. I know that one of the owls that Mercer has as an education animal is quite old. She's, she's, I think, 18 or 20, but that's unusually long. And again, she's captive. So captive animals live a lot longer than, than the ones that have to deal with the, the issues of being out in the wild. Yes. All righty. Um, let's see. Um, somebody did mention, just as, just as a note, that um, the, the John Hines National Wildlife Refuge at Tinica which is down in Philadelphia, um, had a really great long-eared owl a couple of years ago. Um, if you haven't been down there, it's a really lovely, amazing site. Um, so it's a great place to go visit as well. Um, That's a great place to go birding for all kinds of birds. I mean, it's yes. a wonderful place. 
Absolutely. Um, do any of the bat species, um, I'm sorry, do any of the owl species eat bats? There we go. Not that I'm aware of. I've never heard of that. I've never heard of an owl eating a bat. Yeah, I don't think I have either. I wouldn't surprise me, I guess, if they did, but but yeah, I haven't necessarily heard of that. Um, already. Um, are there any birds that other birds that are mistaken for owls? Hmm. You mean as in, in terms of misidentification? I would say I think that's what they mean, yes. Yeah, I would say that that is unlikely because there aren't very many other birds that are out at night. Um, and if you are seeing an owl in the daytime, it's, it's probably roosting and doesn't want to be disturbed. So you can actually get you know reasonably close to a roosting owl because it really doesn't want to move. Whereas if you were getting closer to a hawk or another raptor, they're going to fly away. So I would think not. Alrighty, and that actually answered one of the other questions as well about whether or not an owl would, if you would get close to it or would it flee? Um, excellent. Um, and somebody also mentioned when you were talking about um, snowy owls that there have been confirmed sightings this year um, at Island Beach State Park and Foresight National Wildlife Refuge in New Jersey. So if you're looking for places to go. Yeah, I want to, I mean, if you go um, to eBird and do a, a search, um, you will get the, the reported sightings of, of owls. I will, I will warn you though, that they usually don't put those up um, for a day or two because they don't want the poor owls to get mobbed by people going to look for them. Um, but yeah, Island Beach State Park is a great place to go, go look for snowy owls. And they, they have been seen there already this year, um, starting really at early December. So I don't think it's gonna be as big an eruption year as we had in 14, but it looks like it's shaping up to be a pretty good year. Excellent. Um, somebody wants to know if, um, if did people try to have owls as pets after Harry Potter? Um, and if so, what sort of happened to those people? Obviously, they probably weren't successful. So, you know, what happened when they abandoned those owls? Oh, gosh. Um, that, that's the problem with people trying to do, make pets out of wild animals. If you, if you, are to trying to domesticate a wild animal and then decide you can't keep it and let it go to fend for itself, it's probably not going to be able to. One of the, one of the issues that happens is um, if in order for a, an animal, a wild animal, any animal really to be successful, it has to do, be able to do a number of things. It has to be able to feed itself, it has to be able to defend itself, and it has to recognize what kind of an animal it is so it can find a mate. And if you have raised, um, if, if a person has raised um, an animal from a baby or from an egg, um, it's not gonna be able to do any of those things because it didn't, didn't learn about hunting from its parents. It probably imprinted on you. So it doesn't even think it's an owl. It thinks it's a human um, and it doesn't know how to defend itself. So um, it's really, really a bad idea. <laughs> to try and you know domesticate a wild animal that way because you know then if you decide that you can't keep it any longer and you let it free it's not going to survive it's going to be yep. a sad thing all the way around all righty um gosh everyone everyone has a lot of questions excellent um so a couple of um just comments um David mentioned that um, the great horned owls will occasionally come out um, around dusk. And if you're a photographer, apparently like he is, that's when you can get some great pictures. Um, although he says he has a resident one, so that it really helps if you already know that they're there and you can wait for them. Um, and <laughs> that, that's, let's see. That's, that's really true. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, um, oh, the question about the, the crows was about, um, about referring to them around an owl's nest. Yes, they're probably going for the eggs. So that would be, you know, that would, you know, crows are, you know, opportunistic feeders. They see, you know, eggs in a nest or babies in a nest. They're going to try and go get them. Um, but, you know, owls, uh, you know, adult owls are pretty good at defending their nests. So it probably was creating quite a ruckus. Um, but I'm sure the owls were not going to let the crows anywhere near their babies. So that was probably what the fuss was about. Mm -hmm. um, another plug for, um, for the John Hines National Wildlife Refuge. Um, apparently you can see owl species there quite regularly. 
Um, somebody asked, um, what countries have the most owls? Oh, um, well, it's quite a, there's quite a number of owls across Europe and there's quite a number of owls in Asia. So I would say that the distribution of owls is relatively even across the world. I don't think there's that many in South America, but I think Europe and Asia would probably take the, the high number. All right. All right, this next one I have to admit I've never heard of, um, but apparently there is now a trend in, um, in Japan to have owl cafes, similar to like the cat cafes. Um, so um, in, the, 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 the question, it wasn't such a question as, you know, and more, I think more of a comment that this probably isn't really very fair for the owls. No, I would say not. I would say not. That's not, you know, again, keeping, I mean, unless, unless of course it's a rehabilitated owl that can no longer be safely released to the wild. Um, you know, if an owl has had a, a problem that, it, you know, it can no longer, you know, defend itself or feed itself and you want to use it for you know an educational purpose or to get people you know more attuned to the problems that owls are having out in the wild then you know that's a different story but if you're capturing perfectly healthy owls to put on a display i would say that that's not really a very good thing to do all righty um and laura ask um how long do owls live Again, it depends on the species, but I think, you know, you could safely say, oh gosh, you know, 15 years or so would probably be fair to say. There we go. Um, thank you for the very nice comments. Um, people, um, let's see, another question. Um, gestation period, um, and do they sit on the eggs? Yes, they do sit on the eggs. They do incubate the eggs. And again, um, how long they incubate the eggs, it depends again on the species of owl, but I think roughly speaking, you know, two, two to three weeks is pretty typical. There we go. All righty, let's see what we got here. I think this might be the last one. And it's really, just, it's, um, looks like just a comment. It looks, sounds like there is a group of photographers um, that meet night, that meet each night in Mercer County Park in Pennington um, to watch the owls feeding on prey in a large field there. So that's that's, so Mer you, that's Mercer Meadows. Yes, that's Mercer that's Meadows. Meadows. Yep. Mm -hmm. There we go. So apparently, a very great place to go. So fabulous. All right, I think that's all of our questions. I, I Thank did you see. All. I did see one thing go flying by about where Heinz was. Right. Was oh, Heinz somebody else. Answered. Um, it is um, in Philadelphia, down near the um, down near the airport. Right. Um, it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a hike, although it's right off of 95. Um, so you just hop on 95 and go all the way down. Um, but it's definitely well worth it. Alrighty. I think we are good. Again, if you are interested, you can still sign up for the in-person um, um, Owl Prowl on Saturday night with Diane. Um, you can do that online. Um, and thank you all very much. Hopefully we'll see all of you again. Um, I said next month we're doing uh, just an introduction to um, backyard birds um, in preparation for our great backyard bird count um, for President's Day weekend. So hopefully we'll see you all again there. Um, and there will be, um, this recording will be available on our YouTube channel as well, as long as recordings on a lot of other um, wonderful programming that we've been doing um, since COVID. One good thing about COVID is that we are now producing all kinds of great videos to be able to share with people. Um, so definitely check out our YouTube channel. Um, you can get to it from our website. Um, so thank you all so much. We really, really appreciate it. And I hope everyone has a great evening. Thanks for coming. <laughs>